Good morning. I hope everybody is doing good this morning as we gather here to worship the Lord. I see that everybody's fanning a little. I turned the air down one more notch. Uh, part of the issue with having the uh, ionization running is it keeps the fan running all the time and that doesn't control the humidity kind of as well. So I've turned it down one more notch to try to cool y'all off. But uh, I am glad to see all of you here today. And for those that are worshiping with us online, we're glad to have you. And just ask that uh, whenever you watch this service, if you would just make a note online that uh, who you are and where you're worshiping from, we would appreciate it. A few announcements I want to cover. First of all, uh, all of you that helped in any way with the yard sale, we say thank you. We raised over $3,000 uh, for ministry and mission for the church. Uh, the church has done that for quite a while, and we support different ministries with it, and so we want to thank uh, all of you that work so hard, um, I won't name names because that oh, I don't leave anybody out, but I do want to thank you for that. Uh, also, if uh, you noticed in your bulletin, there is an insert. Uh, if you're willing, now, if you're already serving and you're not rolling off of anything, you will be staying where you are unless I hear from you. But uh, we want to get an idea of where people feel led to serve. So if you will fill that out and put it in the offering box when you leave today, I would appreciate it. We have everything lined up for the teacher luncheon. As you know, we're doing that uh, Wednesday. We're going to be taking the luncheons or the lunches to the school since we've had some COVID back in our church. And then also, I want to encourage you, even if you've never come to one of my Bible studies, I hope you'll come to this Daniel Bible study. Uh, I'm still just in, just finished chapter seven on it. Still got four more chapters to go. Uh, so I don't know that I'll even have it completed by the time we start. But let me tell you, it has been really fascinating to me, uh, especially when you start to get into all the prophecy and everything that's in the book of Daniel. So I would like to just encourage you to come and be part. It starts a week from Wednesday. We'll have it at 10.30 in the morning and at 6 o'clock at night. So I hope that you will uh, come to that. If you would let Gina know in the church office so I can kind of get an idea how many of the, the uh, studies to print off. Uh, I'll probably send them out on email and you can print one off for yourself. But I also want to print off for those that don't, uh, don't have a printer. Is there any other announcements that need to be brought up before we begin worship? Well, again, it's great to see everybody here today, and let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you today, and we thank you so much for this opportunity to come and to meet in this place, and we know that we don't have to ask you to be here because you said you would be here. So what I pray for all of us today is that we would be aware of your presence in this time of worship, for we ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning. Glad to see all of you here today. Let us now stand together to join to sing our call to worship together. Oh, how he loves you and me. That's just all the words you can sing along with me. sing together our first hymn Jesus is all the world to me Cheer me so when I am sad. 
now join with me as we affirm our faith in the Christian faith. Next slide. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn that we're going to sing together is I Am Thine, O Lord. Okay, before we go to prayer to get, uh, together, I want us to do what we did last week. I want us to take a minute and share our joys for the week. Where have you felt like you were specially blessed uh, in what happened in your life or what you saw this week? Anybody? Okay. I did. Uh, last year's prepared the prize. All right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, Chip, tell them the news. Amen. Chip is cancer-free. <laughs> and Miss Gail, you got something you want to say again? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Anybody else, joy that you want to share this morning? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. One joy I want to share with y'all, y'all may have seen it on Facebook. Uh, there was a friend of mine. He became a friend when I was pastoring in Kentucky. He was one of my parishioners. He was a lay speaker. And we had not connected in 17 years. And he, was, he and his wife were coming here to Alabama to visit his daughter. And he finally got the, my right phone number. And so uh, I got to see him and fellowship with him. Uh, and because he went into ministry... I don't know, I guess he he just wanted to talk to me, but it was just great 
And I just thank God when I was sharing on Facebook. The cool thing about being a Methodist preacher is, well, all the moving around we've done is I've got a lot of, a lot of family. And I thank God for that. I thank God for the family I have here at this church, and I just thank you for that. Any other joys? What you want to share with us, Daniel? What you happy about? All right. the work that you're doing in our lives we praise you father for your never ending abiding presence we give you thanks and lord we also come before you to ask that you continue to grow us into your likeness to pray god that you will forgive us where we have failed you and, Father, to pray for things that are upon our heart. Lord, this morning, it just sort of occurred to me as coming to church, thinking about things in our nation, of how the evil one has sought to divide us in so many ways, through politics, through racial divide, through socioeconomics. And, Lord, we're even having battles on, on media about wearing masks. Lord, it just shows how silly we human beings can be. Well, Father, don't let us be divided. Help we, your people, to be united. And Lord, to do what you think is best and that you would guide us in all things. And for where we have chosen to listen to ourselves and to, and rather than you, we pray for forgiveness. But God, we also come before you to pray for people that we're concerned about. While we give you thanks for the healing hand you've had upon us, Lord, there's so many people that we still need to pray for. Lord, we pray for Miss Nellie as she is still in intensive care. We pray for David Ushery, who also has COVID. We thank you, Lord, that his case is not bad since he had the shots, but just ask for his healing. But God, there are so many other people that we need to pray for, and those are just two names that just kind of popped into my brain. But Lord, I pray now that you will hear the prayers of my brothers and sisters. Yes. 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 Any others? Father, I also want to pray for teachers and students who are coming back to class this week. Some maybe already have. I pray, Lord, for a hedge of protection around those students and those children that the, and those teachers that the COVID situation would not become a situation in our schools, that you will protect them so that they can learn. And now, God, I just would ask that you be with us in the remainder of the service. I pray, Lord, you'll be with Miss Betty Crow as she's going to come in a minute to share her testimony. And I thank you, Lord, for her willingness. I pray, God, for Jennifer as she's going to sing a solo in a minute that it will touch our lives. And, Lord, I pray for myself that you will hide me behind the cross, that people will hear what you want them to hear rather than what I have to say. But we ask this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, praying together what he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's exactly what we're going to be talking about this morning. Who we are in Christ, the difference Jesus makes in our lives. 
And thanks be to God for that. When I ask for people who were willing to share a short testimony, uh, Miss Betty Crow said she'd be willing to do it. And we all love Miss Betty, and I'm so thankful for her willingness to come on up and share with us. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my life. I became a Christian at a very uh, early age. I don't remember very much about it. All I can tell you is I truly love Jesus. I joined the Lake Allen Methodist Church at an early age that, uh, in Birmingham. Um, I was um, the fifth child of six children, three boys first, three girls. Now, I was born in 1929, and if you know your history, that was when the stock market crashed. That was the start of the Great Depression. My daddy lost his job lost the nice house we were living in, and we had to move to a substandard home. My dad never owned a car. He was an insurance salesman, and he worked, he walked what he uh, was a debit. Um, so we lived two miles from Central Park Methodist Church, that became my home church. And my daddy and I walked those two miles uh, every Sunday. And I'm gonna tell you, I learned a lot. I listened and I learned. One thing that really stuck out in my mind was, uh, we didn't live very far from the black community. And as you know, we were a segregated state at that time. and the black children would be playing along the road, and my daddy would say to me, Betty, you speak to those children. That taught me a lesson in respect, a respect for all people. Uh, one Sunday, and I suppose this was when we were walking home from church, I said to daddy, uh, why doesn't a preacher ever preach about a sin, and my dad says, I want you to uh, go to that preacher and ask that question. <laughs> so on the steps of Central Park Methodist Church, as he was saying farewell to his parishioners, I, this little straggly-headed young un, oh, looking up at him, said, asked the question. I don't remember the answer. I don't remember what he said back to me. But I uh, hope it made a great influence on him. Um, as a kid, I always sat next to my daddy in church. And when we said the Apostle Creed, he was always two or three words ahead of everybody else. And uh, I think it was because he was so focused on what he was saying. He so believed in what he was saying. Um, Another thing he taught me was um, uh, we got boxes of envelopes. I don't know whether any of y'all remember that or not. We got boxes of envelopes, 52 of them, to put our uh, uh, pledge or our offering, whatever. My daddy never missed a Sunday putting into church his offering. Now, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know that he tithed because we really didn't have very much, but he put out what he could in that envelope every Sunday. Uh, now all of this, as all this was going on, I'm growing in faith. I probably didn't realize it, but I was. I was learning and growing. Now you might be wondering, well, where's the mother? <laughs> Well, two miles was too far for my mother to walk to church. 
and uh, I had my baby sister was sickly. So mother stayed home and cooked our Sunday dinner. But at night, we lived two blocks from the uh, Baptist church, so uh, we would go to the uh, Baptist church at night. Uh, I'm gonna give that church a lot of credit because there I went to a lot of vacation Bible schools, a lot of revivals, and I renewed my faith at that church. Uh, in 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked. And uh, all three of my brothers and my brother-in-law uh, went off to service, and they fought in the fiercest of battles. One of them was shot up really bad. Uh, but now I'm going to tell you what I was doing. I saw a picture of this cute Marine, and I got his address, and I started writing to him, and we wrote two years. And when he came out of service, we met, and John and I had a short courtship. We fell in love, and we got married. We had three great children. Uh, one of them you know, Brenda, and I'm going to tell you right here. I'm going to tell the world she's a wonderful daughter. Um, <clears throat> after 59 years of marriage, God took my uh, husband home. I had never been alone in my entire life. I was very depressed, very lonely. But one day I was sitting on the sofa and something just sort of come over me. And I held out my hand and I felt as if my hand was touched. And a voice came to me saying, everything is going to be all right. And I want to tell you, everything has been all right. God walks with me every day. I have so much joy in my heart. Uh, I, I, sometimes I just want to shout <laughs> because I have so much joy. Um, but I want to tell you, this church means so much to me. I get up on Sunday morning anxious to be here. I don't hear well. Uh, and sometimes I miss our, uh, our pastor's sermons. And I feel really bad about that because I like his sermons and I love him. But you know... I come here to worship a fantastic God. And when I walk down that aisle and I'm speaking to this one and that one and waving to you, this one and that one, I, uh, I, I'm not just talking to a person. I'm talking to my, a member of my church family. You are my family. You bring me joy. You help me to be the person that I am, and I do love you. God wants us to love each other, and I think we truly do. Thank you for listening. Well, I learned something that's different from that I didn't know. When Betty Crow sees her man, she gets her man. Thank you, Betty. We all love you, too. Amen. Our scripture reading will come next, if y'all will pull that up. And the way I'm going to do this today is I'm going to have to show, have y'all to move the slides. So go ahead and move that for us and bring the next one up. Today's scripture, 1 John 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that there, that is what we are, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Next slide, please. <clears throat> one, of, uh, one of my favorite shows that came out many, many years ago was a show called Anne of Green Gables. 
It's been remade, and Bridget got me hooked on it, and I enjoyed watching it. It's about this little uh, red-headed, freckled girl that both of her parents had died when she was just a child, and so she was tossed around from different foster homes where she was mistreated and unloved. <clears throat> so she ended up in an orphanage, and while she was there, the other children made fun of her. They didn't thought her red hair was weird, her freckles were weird. They told her she was ugly and that no one would ever love her. But then, next slide, she became part another situation. Matthew and Marilla Cuppert were brother and sister, had never got married, and they lived in their parents' home. They had each other, but they were very lonely. And so, as Matthew was getting older, they decided that they were going to send for a little boy from an orphanage to come and live with them and to help. But a mistake was made. Anne was sent instead of a little boy. At first, when they came home, when Matthew came home, with little Ann, Marilla didn't want to have anything to do with her. She said, she's got to go back. We needed a little boy to be able to help you. But Ann had already run, won Matthew's heart. And so as time went by, Marilla became to love her too. They loved this little girl so much that they adopted her. And so they loved Anne in a way she never thought was possible. Next slide. So Anne, the one who thought she would never be loved, who thought she would never belong anywhere, who believed she would never have a family, now she had it all. The love of Matthew and Marilla Cuthbert. She was totally accepted, totally loved, and had a new identity. She was no longer an orphan because now she was a cupboard. There are millions of people in our world today that perhaps they are orphaned. Maybe they weren't the best looking. Maybe they grew up with unloving parents or maybe they've been abused or rejected. And these feelings can even impact Christians because we all have different pasts. And that's why I think it's important that we as Christians need to remember what it means to be a born-again Christian. That our identity should be tied up in Christ. But as I mentioned, if you read my news article for this month, we don't necessarily always do that. Men tie up their identity in their jobs. And so when they lose their job or when they retire, it's like they're lost. They don't know who they are. Or women, they get so tied up in raising children that when their kids grow up and move on, they, they're just lost. Or couples that go through a divorce, the one that didn't want the divorce, just kind of their head is spinning. They don't know who they are, what they are. And you know, remember when you were a teenager, and that's not too hard for some of y'all to remember on the front row, but remember when you were a teenager, you wanted to be popular. Now, I was not popular in school. I was just an average guy. But what we ended up doing in high school is we built our identity on what other people thought of us. And what's sad about that is that's not the place we should build our identity. That's why what we do is we're constantly trying to prove something to somebody else so they'll like us. But as Christians, our identity should be built up on who we are in Christ. And that is why over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about what does it mean to be a Christian? What is our identity? Next slide. One of the things what it means to be as a Christ is that you are loved, you are accepted, and you have been adopted. Je uh, the Apostle John writes in the words that were read just a minute ago, 
about this great love of God. And I love the way it's described. It says he's lavishly given upon us. The word lavishly means just so abundant and generous, just overflowing, that we, sinners as we are, are over, given overflowing love by the, God, by the God who loves us. That we, like Ann, don't deserve, didn't really have anybody to love us, and yet God, out of his grace, accepts us and adopts us. We don't have to try to win his favor. No, he loves us. Now, well, let me kind of differentiate this sermon so you understand. God loves every human being. And every human being is God's child in a physical way because we've been made by God. But the Bible teaches us that there's a difference when you say you're a born-again Christian. That there is something that happens that is so awesome and so powerful. And folks, you don't get any more loved than to be adopted into God's spiritual family. Paul says this in Ephesians 1.5, God's unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. Now, do you hear what this is saying, church? This means that before the world was even created, God knew you and I were going to live. He knew we were going to sin, but God already had a plan worked out whereby we, those sinners that we are, we were away from God, yet he had a plan in place that he could adopt us and make his, his spiritual children, that we are no longer orphaned by sin but instead, we are part of the family of God. I love that old song. And as I was sharing with some this morning, I worked on this sermon Thursday and I prayed before I did. And then all this, I, I couldn't type fast enough that the Holy Spirit was just giving these things. And then this song popped into my mind. Now, y'all forgive the first part of it, but I'm going to try to sing it. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as I travel this sod. For I'm part of a family, the family of God. And then the words go on to say, listen to this, folks. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags, rags unto riches, from weak to the strong. I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. Can I get an amen this morning, folks? Paul reminds us that it brings God great pleasure to do this for us. That when our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that he, Jesus tells us in Luke 15, that there are a party in heaven. There's more joy in heaven when a one person accepts Jesus. But there's only one way that we get this adoption. I'm sorry, I didn't make the rules. God did. And the way we get this acceptance and adoption and, and to be brought in the family of God is only through Jesus Christ. For John tells us in John chapter 1, verses 11 through 12, it says this, even his own, meaning Jesus, even his own land and among his own people, he was not accepted. But... To all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Jesus has given you the right to become a child of God. So if you've accepted your Lord and Savior, you can say, and I'm asking this church to say it with me, and I don't want you to say it like, I'm loved. I mean, I want you to say it with enthusiasm. Repeat after me. I am loved. I am, loved. I am, accepted. I am accepted. I am adopted. 
I am a child of the King. Folks, that is our identity in Christ. We are not some little nobody. We are royalty because we are part of God's family. Next slide. Also, because there of all of that, therefore you become a friend of God. The story I've been telling y'all about Anne, she develops this friendship with a little girl named Diana. Diana is from a very well-to-do family and dresses very fancy. And, of course, Anne is from an orphan a home, but she's living with the cupboards. And they're not poor, but they're certainly not rich. So you've got Anne from a very different background, orphaned, living in a poor home or poor home. You've got Diana who enjoys all the riches, completely different background, yet they become the very best of friends. And it occurred to me that is sort of what it is like for us. We were kind of like orphans because of sin. We don't have it all together, yet Jesus is the very Son of God, and he becomes our friend. The moment we say yes to Jesus, Jesus said this about us. I no longer call you servants, because a master doesn't confide in his servants. Now you are my friends. Now who is God? Who is Jesus? He is God in the flesh, right? So if we're friends with Jesus, that means we are friends with God. Before we were estranged by sin, an enemy of God because of our sinful nature. Not that God didn't love us, but our sinful nature estranged us from God. We were, we were against God's purposes, but the moment we say yes to Jesus, those walls of hostility fall, and God calls us friends. And folks, the thing about this friend is other friends may leave you alone. Other friends may turn their back on you. But Jesus will never leave you. So, if you are a born-again Christian, say this with me. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. And also because of that, next slide. You become an heir of God. Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Now, what does it mean to be an heir? If you're an heir of a rich person, that means somewhere in the future, all that this person has is going to be given to you. It's because the heir chooses for you to become their heir. Now think about what all has Christ been given as the Son of God and the Son of Mary. We know that he ascended back to the right hand of the Father where he lives in the complete glory of heaven. But the Bible's teaching us that whatever has been given to Christ will be given to us. All of the glory of heaven, the splendor of God's kingdom will be ours because we are heirs of God and we are co-heirs with Christ. That means two things. God wants you to have this blessing. And secondly, Jesus doesn't mind sharing these blessings with you. Jesus did all the suffering, all the dying, all the pain, but he doesn't mind sharing that kingdom with you. And we know when y'all come, and I'm hoping all of you will come to the Daniel Bible study. When I got to chapter 7, which to me is one of the most exciting books in the entire book of Daniel. And you see this imagery of these four beasts and what they do. And, and how one of the beasts has ten horns. And one of the horns really represents the Antichrist. And Daniel's all upset and he says, well, what does this mean? And a, an angel tells him this. These four beasts represent four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But now listen to this. But in the end, the holy people of uh, the, the people of the most high God will be given the kingdom. They will rule forever and ever. That's all the way in the Old Testament. 
that those who belong to the most highly God. And then Jesus says this in Revelation 2. So all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, I will give them authority over all nations. They will rule the nations. They will have the same authority I have received from the Father, and I will give them the morning star. So, folks, that means you won't have some little run-down shack in heaven. It means you will be royalty and that you will have authority, not that you deserve it, but because God has so lovingly, lavishly poured out his love on us. And just like Anne and the story I'm telling you, received the full authority of being an heir of the cupboard because she belonged to Marilla and to Matthew so it is for us because we belong to Christ. So folks, say this with me. I'm an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. I'm an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. Folks, this you ought to have y'all saying amen to the top of the rooftops. This is good news, folks. If this stuff don't get exciting to you, I don't know what will. Because this lets us know what, who we are, folks. Also, next slide. If you're accepted and adopted, you're a one spirit with God. Jesus told his disciples right before he died and was later going to ascend that he was going to be leaving. But he said, y'all don't worry about it. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, how does he come to us? Through his Holy Spirit. And Paul tells us that when we accept Christ, we become joined to the Lord by his Holy Spirit. This means that God's Holy Spirit comes to live in us when we accept Christ. And we are therefore connected to the Holy Trinity. Because God the Father wants us attached to him. God the Son made a way for it to happen. And God the Holy Spirit made it happen. God, God is high and holy. And he really shouldn't ever want to have anything to do with us. But because of his great love, he's not only adopted us, but he sent his spirit to us. Now folks, we have to realize that is a huge, high, holy privilege that sinners such as I would have God's own Holy Spirit to live within us. But folks, there's something else besides the glory and honor of that. There is the power that comes along with it. For Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 through 20, I pray that you will begin to understand the incredible greatness of his power for those who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. The power of the Holy Spirit that reached down into the grave and reanimated the dead, lifeless body of, of Jesus, the son of Mary, because Jesus, the, the eternal Christ, lived on. But the same power that reanimated that body is the same power that lives within us, folks. So, that means we have the power to overcome any and all temptation, for greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in the world, 1 John 4, 4. That we can do all things that God wants us to do. For we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Philippians 4.13. That we can face any obstacle that Satan wants to throw in our path. Because we are more than conquerors. Romans 8.37. And why? Why? All because of this great love that has been lavishly poured upon us. So say with me, I am one with the Spirit of God. God lives with me. I am one with the Spirit of God. God lives in me. So folks, to wrap this up, if anyone is in Christ... 
as she sang while ago, not even knowing my sermon, we're redeemed. The old has been wiped away. Everything is new. We used to be spiritual orphans, but now, because of God's great love for us, we are children of the King. So, folks, we don't need to build our identity on whether we're pretty or ugly, fat or thin, red-haired or blonde, old or young, rich or poor. Our identity should be built on who we are in Jesus Christ. Well, folks, the truth of the matter is, though, that even Christians sometimes struggle with understanding it. Bridget had something to do with this sermon, something she's been talking to me a long time ago about by another book that I've not even read. But I struggle sometimes with my identity. We need to realize this because, folks, even Christians sometimes feel unloved. Sometimes we feel like we don't belong. But, folks... We can belong. We do belong. It's my prayer that every single person in this room has accepted Jesus Christ. And if you haven't, today would be the day you would. But maybe you have accepted him, but sometimes you still kind of beat yourself up. Sometimes you feel a little less than loved. Maybe you need to come and ask Jesus right here in this room, help me. To understand the identity I have in you. So that you can stand tall with a raised head. Not because of you are who you are. But because to whom you belong. Amen. Let's pray. Father this morning as we move to a closing song. I thank you for this message that encouraged me this week. As your Holy Spirit just came and gave it to me for all glory, honor, and praise belongs to you for this good news. But Lord, it is my prayer today, if there's anyone here that feels sometimes unloved, if there's anyone here sometimes that feel like they don't belong, if there's anyone here that just needs reassurance that you're here, that Lord, that we would not just pass this opportunity by to come and pray about it. And Lord, it is also always my prayer that if there's someone here that has never truly said yes to Jesus, that they would so they could become part of this kingdom. So Lord, move in our midst. Lead people according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. The invitation is this. If you struggle with your identity at times, if you need to feel God's grace, you're invited just to come, pray, and then get back up, go to your seat. I don't have to pray with you unless you want to. I don't want to make people feel intimidated. But if you do need that reassurance, I invite you to come. Please stand together now as we join to sing. My faith looks up to thee. My More love to thee. My faith looks up to thee.
Yes. Thank you. 